Brendan Eich created the first version of JavaScript in 10 days. Since then, JavaScript has evolved, and Brendan has watched the growth of the web give rise to new and unexpected use cases. Today, Brendan Eich is still pushing the web forward across the technology stack with his involvement in the WebAssembly specification and the Brave browser. For all of its progress, JavaScript struggles to run resource-intensive programs like complex video games. With JavaScript falling short on its charge to be the assembly language for the web, the four major browser vendors started collaborating on the WebAssembly project to allow programming languages a faster, lower-level compile target when deploying to the web. Brendan is the CEO of Brave, which aims to provide a faster and safer browsing experience by blocking ads and trackers, by default, in his new browser. The Brave browser is also helping publishers monetize in interesting new ways, while also giving a share of ad revenue to its users. Caleb Meredith is the host of this show. He previously guest-hosted a popular episode on Inferno, a fast, React-like JavaScript framework. As we bring on more guest hosts, please send us feedback. We want to know what every host is doing well and what we can improve on. Thanks again for listening to Software Engineering Daily. Life is too short to have a job that you don't enjoy. If you don't like your job, go to Hired.com slash SE Daily. Hired makes finding a new job enjoyable. And Hired will connect you with a talent advocate that will walk you through the process of finding a better job. It's like a personal concierge for finding a job. Maybe you want more flexible hours or more money or remote work. Maybe you want to work at Facebook or Uber or Stripe or some of the other top companies that are desperately looking for engineers on Hired. You deserve a job that you enjoy because you're someone who spends their spare time listening to a software engineering podcast. Clearly, you're passionate about software, so it's definitely possible to find a job that you enjoy. Check out Hired.com slash SE Daily to get a special offer for Software Engineering Daily listeners. A $1,000 signing bonus from Hired when you find that great job that gives you respect and salary that you deserve as a great engineer. I love Hired because it puts more power in the hands of engineers. Go to Hired.com slash SE Daily to get advantage of that special offer and thanks to hired for being a continued longtime sponsor of software engineering daily i'm here with brendan nike the creator of javascript programming language and the ceo of brave software brendan welcome to software engineering daily Hi, thanks for having me. So let's get started talking about WebAssembly. So the lowest human readable instruction format that we can give to a machine is some assembly language, the details of which depend on the machine. JavaScript is a much higher level programming language, yet it is still often has been described as the assembly language for the web. But recently, a W3C community group, which you, Brendan, are involved, has been working on a WebAssembly specification. Why is an assembly language for the web useful? And why is JavaScript insufficient in its current place as the web assembly language? Sure. Uh, So first of all, I'll start with how JavaScript came to fill this uh, role. So JavaScript, I did in a hurry in 1995, in 10 days in May at Netscape. And it was partly rushed because of internal uh, politics around whether Java was enough. Turns out JavaScript because it loads with the HTML and can be written by anybody and start from small scripts and grow to big programs, kind of vanquished Java from the client side of the web uh, over the last 22 almost years. But um, JavaScript was a rush job. It had bones borrowed from other languages, put together in kind of a Frankenstein body in a hurry by me. And yet, because it got out early enough, not just due to the Netscape politics, but due to the Microsoft um, Windows, you know, OS uh, tying of Internet Explorer that was bearing down on Netscape, the eventually, you know, convicted monopoly abuse in the USV Microsoft case, we knew we had to go fast. If we got something out in Netscape 2, and there were several things like JavaScript, Java was hoped for, there were new innovations in the HTML version of the time that Netscape was driving, if we got them out early enough, they would become part of the web standards. And really, JavaScript was one of the very few things that survived and endured. And therefore, it's this zero install, 
a language runtime that is available almost everywhere. It's on mobile devices, it's in, embedded in apps through web views, and of course it's in the browsers, which are still economically important um, on mobile and especially on desktop, uh, but on both. So now come at it from a point of view of someone developing software. In the 90s, you would compile maybe for Windows PC, you would use Microsoft Visual C++, if you needed a database, you'd use you know, Rogue Wave or, or Libneo or something. Fast forward through the web and suddenly nobody does that anymore. Everyone's doing zero install web-based things. But the game uh, developers are still using C++ because they need to get to the metal. And there are, to be fair, there are, I exaggerated when I said nobody does that. There are other fat apps still being built. There are just fewer. And the browser has, has absorbed or eaten most of them and turned them into you know, server-side, service-based, service uh, software model businesses. So yet games endure, others a sort of hardcore, down-to-the-metal apps endure. Um, and if they have to use JavaScript, you have problems. Because JavaScript is, besides being a Rust job, we've made it better over the last 20 years in standards. Uh, it, is, it, it, it got better, it got bigger, it grew affordances and smoothed out some of the awkward spots. Um, and it has, has done well. But um, it is a garbage collected language. It has um, uh, you know, performance uncertainty. Let's see, if, uh, per performance unpredictability is one way to put it, where you may be doing something at 60 frames a second um, for a game and suddenly you, you run out of real time because of a garbage collection that has to happen to reclaim memory. Or you've been using the latest engines that do just-in-time compiling and your program has changed the sort of phase of types that it's speculated on through that just-in-time compiler and now all that code that was generated according to certain assumptions or inferences has to be recompiled. That can take a lot of wall time too and can push you out of the current you know, 1 60th of a second frame of animation budget that you have, push you out of that soft real-time limit. And then the game gets a, a, a sort of slow or laggy or it, the animation doesn't update properly. And that's a competitive drawback for games, so they like to stay in C or C++, they like to stay close to the metal. What we discovered, because JavaScript became so ubiquitous and so fast, aside from these unpredictable performance um, cliffs, we found that, that if you used a subset of JavaScript, this was at Mozilla starting in 2012, if you focus just on the parts of JavaScript that looked like the C programming language and, and used memory in a flat, large, contiguous array, this was a feature added for WebGL called typed arrays, then if you use that subset of JavaScript and that memory model, you could go as, almost as fast as, as C or C++. You could go as fast as any safe, native, runtime approach to such low-level languages. And there were some predecessors in this space going back into the 90s no one's heard of, um, but also uh, notably uh, the portable native client work at Google, which was ongoing at that time in 2012. So at Mozilla, we developed this subset of JavaScript. We called it asm.js in honor of assembly language. We wrote a type system for it. Dave Herman uh, did that. Um, Luke Wagner at Mozilla, who's still there, did this amazing um, compiler backend for that type-checked subset of JavaScript so that while you were parsing the JavaScript, you could decide that it was in that ASM.js subset and you could very quickly generate really good like machine-level code, but with memory safety. That was the crucial you know, requirement. So anything you're going to have zero install ability to execute from a website has to be safe. It cannot be running in, the, in a way that could just trivially own your, your user identity and possibly take over your machine. Uh, you know, there, security is never done. There are always flaws in every piece of significant software. So browsers have vulnerabilities. But having a memory safe language like JavaScript or the ASM.js subset was a requirement. When we did this work at Mozilla, we, we uh, also used a compiler that had been developed by someone there, Alon Zakai. Uh, he'd written Mscripten as an LLVM-based uh, C or C++ compiler that generated JavaScript. And to tell the truth, ASM.js was formalized as a type system by Dave Herman, but Alon actually, I think he spoke in 2011, JSConf EU, Alon had already developed uh, an intuitive understanding of this subset and this type system for assembly-like JavaScript. Um, by building this Mscript and compiler and making it generate JavaScript and making that JavaScript go fast and using this typed array approach to a very flat uh, contiguous memory uh, region for you know sort of the usual C global variables and the heap um, 
JavaScript stack is for the stack variables in C. The translation is very tight and can be optimized. And alone did this work ahead of, of us understanding what ASM.js was. Again, there were, there were precursors to this. There was somebody at Adobe Labs who did a system, I think it was called Alchemy, that used an earlier version of the LLVM compiler framework to do a similar thing targeting ActionScript 3 in the Flash player. So we were aware of that work, and um, it, it was in this so, sort of school of safe native code runtime techniques that we, we, we were studying. But when we realized ASM.js could be just a subset of JavaScript with the typed array uh, extension that was becoming standardized as WebGL finally got into all the OSs, including iOS, um, we, we realized this is, this is likely to be the new safe portable native code runtime. This is, this is going to kill portable native client at Google. And the, the Pinnacle people at Google didn't want to admit that, but we actually made it happen. Luke Wagner wrote his fast compiler back end. Alone Zakai kept working on his MScript and compiler front end that generated the code, the JavaScript code. Dave Herman made sure the type system was sound. And, and by late 2012, we contacted um, Epic Games, uh, maker of the Unreal Engine, uh, and uh, had a small team visit them. And in less than a week, in four days, the fifth day they arrested was uh, bringing the Unreal Engine 3 to the web by cross-compiling its C++ code base, you know, multi-million line code base, into JavaScript and to the ASM.js subset of JavaScript. And, you know, you had to do things like match their audio uh, APIs to the web audio interface. And they had adapters for OpenAL and other audio libraries. That was not hard. They were already using OpenGL uh, for mobile GPU optimized rendering. WebGL is based on OpenGL, so that, that was a quick adaptation. They had to fix a bug in Inscription or two. They had to fix a bug in the, the compiling just-in-time backend, which runs on the whole ASM.js module, so it's kind of ahead of time in some sense. And, and when at that week ended, they had Unreal Engine 3 running full frame rate on, on, uh, on a, in, in Firefox, in a, in a prototype version of Firefox. And you know Tim Sweeney, the founder of Epic, was stunned. He said, I thought this would take years. Suddenly, it's here. Um, from that point at Mozilla, we just kept working on it, making sure that it worked for other games. We worked with the Unity folks. Uh, they, I think that announced the following year. Um, we, we let Microsoft know, and they got interested. So I had an invited talk at Microsoft to their engineers. And after that, I met with uh, Andres Helsberg, creator of .NET and C Sharp, and uh, Steve Luco, who was then heading the JavaScript engine team, the Chakra core team at, at Microsoft. And they were very interested in ASM, and they got on board uh, at that meeting and pretty soon announced it. And so over time, uh, the last three years or so, um, ASM.js just became this inevitability that you could make it super fast. It was the runtime you already had in your browser instead of trying to add a second runtime as not only portable native client, but Dart had proposed to do, and it really pretty much failed. Uh, even in Chrome, to succeed at doing because it's very difficult to add a second runtime after JavaScript. I can I can get into why. Even Flash, which was a second runtime as a plugin, was going down. Um, Steve Jobs had banned it from iOS, and th therefore it, it was withdrawn for mobile from Android around 2011, I think. And and so uh, there was nothing else in town. If you wanted to have a fast uh, machine level optimizing runtime for languages, then the browser. The only problem was everyone said it only understood JavaScript. But now with ASM.js, there was this sort of subset that could be used as a target language for compilers. And people had already been building uh, hundreds of compilers from various languages like Python or Java or Ruby to JavaScript over the last you know, six years. And this, this was a topic uh, at conferences. People were aware of Emscripten being just one of many among this large set of compilers. Some of these compilers didn't have to work hard to optimize because they were taking a language that was not particularly fast and, and mapping it to JavaScript. Often they were mapping languages that were of similar semantic level and style to JavaScript, so it was a good fit. That was came to be known as transpiling, and it's even done for future versions of JavaScript to older older versions. But um, but Emscripten was the one that pushed things to the metal and got used by the game developers, and especially when Unity Five just got their, their tool chain around it, suddenly you could take any Unity game and press a button and out comes what they called the WebGL port, which really meant ASM.js, WebGL, Web Audio, um, and you could embed it in HTML. Just think you could have like a game that had been on Xbox have a second life on the web, and you could put it on a store and have, you know, try before you buy, just load it in your browser and play. 
so that was a great success. And how did that lead to WebAssembly? It, um, it was clear that JavaScript could be the one VM, or the virtual machine for JavaScript could be the one VM for multiple languages. But JavaScript was still loaded as source, even Asm.js's source. And when I designed JavaScript, you know, I didn't pick the shortest keyword for function. It's eight letters. Um, it, there's just an inherent cost to parsing JavaScript. Even if you compress it when you're transporting it, you, you know, sort of transfer uh, compression, transport layer compression, which you know, saves bandwidth on the network, saves data cost, you still have to uncompress it in memory on the target device and then parse it. And it turns out that was why you know, running a, a, a Unity game or even a game that you can play today like Ski Safari is having an afterlife on Facebook as an Asm.js compiled game. You can go there and play it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, it was originally a mobile game. It uses Unity, I believe. Uh, kind of 2D-ish. It has the third dimension, but it's a fun downhill you know, cartoony skiing game. Uh, runs at full frame rate, but the load time's a little slow. Runs best in Firefox because of Luke Wagner's great work. The, the VA team at, at Google didn't quite want to do the same kind of full program compilation that Luke did. The Microsoft folks did. They actually took Luke's code and they sort of changed its style, but they kept the copyright credit to Mozilla uh, and it had to be licensed in a license they could, they could use. So you'll actually find in Chakra Core, which is on GitHub, that's the engine in Edge and IE now, you'll find a version of Luke's Odin Monkey compiler for Asm.js. And that's, that's why some, some browsers are better than others at Ski Safari. But the load time is a pain. And, and if games you know, change levels, there's a hit there too. So even before I left Mozilla in 2014, we were thinking, you know, how are we going to fix this? Maybe there is a binary syntax that does make sense for this Asm.js subset. And that's how what the, the glimmer of WebAssembly came into our eyes. And since we got Microsoft on board with it, at some point, this might have been early 2015, I'm not sure when, I heard rumors, there was a fight inside Google between the V8 team and the portable native client team. There was, quote, blood on the ground. And at the end, the V8 team won. And it was just, as I said, clear to everyone, you're not going to get a second safe native code runtime. Rather, let's, let's take the JavaScript engine and give it a second input language, which is WebAssembly. Apple also, and Apple never announces early or agrees early, they always like to control their story at WADC, but Apple got on board. I can say that now in, in hindsight. I didn't want to disclose it then. Um, you know, people on Hacker News were doubting, but now you've got all four browser vendors on board with WebAssembly. And some of them are even saying, yeah, Asm.js is just a version, a subset of JavaScript we happen to run fast. We don't even need to recognize it as such to make it fast. You give us some C-like low-level JavaScript that uses a, a big type directory from memory, we'll make it fast, don't worry about it. And so Asm.js became less of this sort of whipping boy from the point of view of why don't you have a proper you know, binary syntax and, and just a stepping stone, uh, a convincing argument to WebAssembly. And once all the browser vendors were on board, WebAssembly was, was going forward as a community group project, as you mentioned, in W3C. And, and really on GitHub, where the code and the design docs are. Release the Kraken. Git Kraken, that is. Are you tired of feeling like you're sailing the stormy seas because you have a clunky, old Git user interface? Unleash the beast that is Axosoft's Git Kraken, voted 2017's most popular Git GUI for Windows, Mac, and Linux. Git Kraken is designed to make you a more productive Git user. The app offers efficiency, elegance, and reliability. The UI equips you with a visual understanding of your branching, merging, and commit history, and it features multiple profile support, one-click undo and redo, a built-in merge tool, and fast search. Run the installer, open the app, and set sail with Git Kraken. Easily set up integrations with GitHub, GitHub Enterprise, Bitbucket, and GitLab. That's one high-performance sea monster. Visualize your version control and code on into the sunset, sailors. Visit gitkraken.com slash sedaily and use promo code sedaily to get $10 off Git Kraken Pro. Git Kraken is free for non-commercial use, so if you're a solo developer, don't worry about the cost, but we'd still love it if you went to gitkraken.com slash sedaily. Thanks to Git Kraken for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. From a 
basic level, what is WebAssembly? What does it look like, right? You open up a WebAssembly file, what's in there? So I, I hope I motivated why, why it's useful and why it happened. Uh, it is useful because it loads faster and it gives you this low-level uh, model of memory and instructions so you have definite performance. You can do 60 frames a second in first-person shooter games. Uh, what is it? Well, if you think about JavaScript for a second as a C-like language and its expression grammar, it has all the, the bitwise uh, logical and shift operators. It has... Um, with somewhat messed up precedents <laughs> due to history uh, of C language, and it has you know the arithmetic you know operators. JavaScript doesn't have integer types explicitly, but through the bitwise operators, you can cast to integer 32-bit unsigned and signed integers in temporaries in expression evaluation, and that's the key to ASM.js. That's how ASM.js can have integers that are fast that don't go through the floating point unit, don't turn into double precision IEEE 754 numbers that people like to blame me for that are in JavaScript and Java. The, the real problem with JavaScript is it only has that number type, so people sometimes want to use a different type and it just isn't there yet. We're working on fixing that. Um, but in any language that has IEEE 754 double binary precision, if you add 0.1 plus 0.2 and you print the result faithfully, you'll find that it's not 0.3, it's 0.3000000000008. And that's because you're actually doing the math in binary, not decimal, and there's uh, extra precision is needed to compute how to round, but you do round with error because of the, the finite precision, and you end up with that 8 at the end after a lot of zeros. Um, that's IEEE 7 by 4. So with JavaScript, the bitwise uh, logical and shift operators give you the ability to deal with 32-bit signed and unsigned integers if you use those operators as if they were typecasts. And if you, uh, you know, it's easy for a compiler like Emscripten to do this, so that's part of the magic that alone Zakai discovered that led to and was formalized as ASM.js to make uh, really fast integer math in the subset of JavaScript. WebAssembly just gives you better syntax for that. Instead of writing out you know, infix operators in JavaScript, you can have, um, I think they've gone with a sort of little stack machine language for the expression part of the, of the grammar. And it can be a, uh, have a bit syntax that's very efficient to parse as well as to transfer. Uh, for the larger program structures, the control structures in the program, like if, then, else, and, and you know, while loops or, or other kinds of loops, um, Obviously, JavaScript has those. WebAssembly has them, too. They're in a, in a structured form. When Java was uh, developed, it was mapped to bytecode, and then that bytecode was sent around the web. And the problem was you could get someone untrusted sending you bad Java bytecodes. So you had to run what's called the verifier on it. And for the longest time, absent some type information they finally added, verification could have bad pathological behavior. I think my friend Michael Franz, a professor at UC Irvine, showed it could have, like, order end of the fourth power complexity. If you, if you sent a torture test, sort of a, a travesty of bytecode at a verifier, it would suddenly take a long time. You could do denial of, of service attacks on verifiers. Um, with WebAssembly, we, we learned from this. So the WebAssembly binary syntax, even though it's a sort of a mix of, um, of uh, prefix uh, sort of um, and postfix for the expression part, stack machine code, uh, it, it's sort of self verifying in the sense that if you parse it, it's not going to do anything crazy. You don't have to verify it, that it's not tricking you. Because the verifier was trying to check that th this malicious bytecode didn't try to do type confusion, where you have an if, then, else, and in the then part, you, you send the value through memory or through a variable of one type, and in the else, you, you attack using a, a bad type pun or a different type, and then it, after the if, then, else, the, the values are still used, but they're used under the wrong assumption that they have only one type. Um, that verification was important for security. Uh, with WebAssembly, you don't have the, the sort of nasty um, control flow analysis problem that, that Java bytecode had for the longest time, where you, you can have type confusion unless you do this, this careful analysis of the spaghetti of go-tos that are possible in Java bytecode. So as far as I know, there is no unrestricted go-to in WebAssembly. They've been changing it a bit, but I think it's still structured code in the sense, the old 70s sense of structured programming. No, no random go-tos, you know, go-to considered harmful. Um, and and it, it is more concise, it loads faster, it parses faster, uses less battery. So the games that you play like Ski Safari now can just be that much faster and better uh, uh, when compiled to WebAssembly instead of ASM.js. 
Yeah, so that transitions well into our next question. You've been talking a lot of video games, and frankly, most WebAssembly presentations also demo some kind of video game written in C++ and compiled with WebAssembly. Um, what are some cases for WebAssembly besides enabling graphics-intensive video games to run the web? Or, or is that the only use case, and that use case is just incredibly compelling with the rise of web, web VR or for other reasons? I think the latter is a good point, but it's not the only use case by a long shot. So first of all, games are very sophisticated. I, I used to go to the Game Developer Conference. I remember hearing a talk from one of the, I think it was the, C, the uh, sort of uh, Valve CTO. He, he made the point that games kind of took over for practical systems research from operating systems. They went into the GPU when it was still possible to have GPUs, you know, not manage <laughs> malicious code well or sandbox different sort of threads of execution. Um, they went into you know multi-core. Uh, they went into sort of vector uh, processing units, the so-called SIMD units, single instruction multiple data units that we have on pretty much all competent hardware now. Um, games were really using everything. They were using threads. They were doing DSP. They're doing physics, so that's not rendered, but it requires a lot of computation. Um, they're doing AI. AI is, is now you know a big buzz phrase everywhere, and so. Uh, WebAssembly is good for all those use cases. It's good for machine learning algorithms on on your device, which is you know can be quite practical. They don't have to be in the cloud using supercomputers in, in the cloud. They can sometimes run using simpler algorithms very effectively on your local data. It's something we're interested in. Brave. They um, it, people need AI not just for games but for all sorts of things now for assistance and you know help, uh, helper apps, um, voice to uh, text and vice versa. So. WebAssembly is just good for all these computationally intensive workloads. So games are great because they're fun to demo and people like them. And like I said, they really do sort of put it all together. The one thing that they don't recapitulate uh, is the sort of dynamic language workload of JavaScript. So people think, oh, WebAssembly, that means we can get rid of JavaScript. Well, not yet. WebAssembly is starting as this target language with a fixed memory uh, space for C and C++. And there are things on the roadmap that will add garbage collection, which has to be done in cooperation with the one true garbage collector of the one true language runtime, the JavaScript engine. Otherwise, you end up with this sort of guest um, host cycle collector problem where anytime you have two garbage collected systems that can form references to each other's heaps, they can form cyclic references. If the garbage collectors don't have special protocols for talking to each other, or there isn't a super collector that runs, those, those cycles become uncollectible. Um, and that's an argument for what .NET has, which is a multi-language, a polyglot a virtual machine that has one memory manager. And that's what JavaScript is growing now. It, it grows the polyglot support through WebAssembly. But WebAssembly in its current minimum viable product, or MVP form, is really about being a great target for C and C++ and maybe some other languages that can sort of fit the model. Over time, you have to add garbage collection in this um, cons consolidated way so that everyone's using the, the host GC and the jo JavaScript engine, not running their own guest GC in the WebAssembly code. Uh, I mean, you can do that too if you want, but if you ever form references, you're going to have uncollectible cycles. They, they also want, for dynamic languages, fast dynamic dispatch of a method that might or might not be on an object. So like JavaScript, Ruby, and Python, Sometimes you have um, no type system, no statement in the code of what the type of an object is, and you call a method on it. But you call the same method pretty much from the same call side all the time. This is how just-in-time compilers successfully speculate. And yet, um, WebAssembly doesn't have the instructions for that yet. Even the Java VM grew invoke dynamic, if you know what that instruction in the Java, Java bytecode does. So we, that can be put on the roadmap, and that's, that's going to happen, I think, but it's down the road. And a few other things have to be done to really support truly dynamic, untyped languages, as well as, as, as the sort of statically typed languages, C and C++, and Rust from Mozilla and others, that I think will work well with WebAssembly as their target, compiler target language right now, or very soon. Um, and that means, you know, you can't get rid of JavaScript that fast. And in fact, JavaScript's <laughs> going to be <laughs> obligatory for so long, there's no definite schedule in which you can say, oh, yes, by, you know, Fourth quarter of 2018, we will take out JavaScript and just have a WebAssembly <laughs> engine, and all the JavaScript on the web will have to be sort of compiled, maybe by the browser, into WebAssembly. That, that's not a credible plan. There is no such plan yet. We'd evolved there in, in over many years, and I think it could happen, but it's, it's just over the horizon. Will code compiled to WebAssembly eventually have access to all the browser APIs 
that JavaScript has access to? And will you one day be able to write an entire application in a language other than JavaScript that compiles to WebAssembly? Uh, I think the answer in principle is yes, yes, the APIs that JavaScript can access should be accessible to WebAssembly. And you can do that anyway since WebAssembly is designed to work in a module, which is something that's coming to JavaScript uh, in e ECMAScript 2015 or so-called ES6. Um, we're still getting the sort of way that modules work in browsers down uh, as a separate spec out of the what working group. Uh, it's taking a while, but um, the, the WebAssembly uh, idea is modular, and that means you'll have, like I said, you could have a JavaScript app that starts using a WebAssembly module for machine learning or for a little bit of physics engine or a little bit of intensive you know, numerical uh, computation. You could do that right away um, if you use C or C++ to write the source of that, that algorithm that you're putting into WebAssembly. Uh, that means you'll have a mix-and-match model for JavaScript and WebAssembly, so it's always possible to sort of proxy API calls that JavaScript can do to the WebAssembly code. But um, there is good thinking going on right now in WebAssembly, uh, in the, the design group, um, you know, which concentrates some big brains among the four browser vendors, on how to make it easy and safe to call any API efficiently through WebAssembly. Um, and so I think the, the general answer is yes, you'll get all those APIs. Um, and yes, you could. Like the games that are already cross compiled are entirely in the target language. It may be Asm.js today because WebAssembly support just turned on in, you know, in some top browsers. But uh, you know, in a year, could they, those games like Ski Safari on Facebook, um, you know, Heroes of Paragon, those, those are games I've played on Facebook compiled to, Web, to Asm.js. They could be compiled to WebAssembly. And when they are, it's pretty much the whole program is WebAssembly. So you can do modules, you can mix and match, you can do a whole program. So in a world where a developer can write an entire program in any language that compiles to WebAssembly, then JavaScript, the language, must make the argument that it is actually a good programming language. You know, after all, a developer could write their entire app in Rust or Haskell or some unknown future language without touching JavaScript. So, you know, as the creator of JavaScript, I, I'd like to ask, why would anyone actively choose to write their web app in JavaScript? Is there some merit to JavaScript besides the fact that you know, it's part of this evolutionary system, right? And it has the share that it has today because of being the only dynamic language in the browser. Well, I think, uh, you know, opinions vary on languages. You go to Hacker News and you still see people wasting gobs of time arguing about Blub. Blub I really want to hear Paul... your opinion, though. <laughs> Paul, I will give it. Paul Graham's view of things okay. is, you know, pe people just fall in love with one language that they learned first or that they, they think is best and they... They argue chauvinistically for it. I'm not going to do that for JavaScript. Java, I use many languages. JavaScript mm. has mm -hmm. has virtues apart from being uh, ubiquitous through get, getting on early enough <laughs> due to that Rust job in May 1995 that I did. But JavaScript has evolved, and that evolution has been important. And you know, you hear sort of armchair, um, you know, Monday morning quarterbacks in the 22 year sense say, oh, you know, <laughs> it could have been Python. Well, no, it couldn't have because Python would have been frozen like a fly in amber in 1995. And that was Python 1.3. You don't want that. Also, Python had unsafe foreign function interfaces, still does. You don't want those on the web. So it would have been a subset of Python. And then if it was frozen as JavaScript was for too long, and there was this sort of standards process that stalled, and then we had to have Firefox to restart the browser market, you would have had evolution of Python along a different lineage. It would have been web Python. It would have gone from very old, out of date. People would have been cursing it for not being up to snuff with Python 2. And then it would have tried to jump forward, but would have had to go sideways of it because the web is a different environment. And so evolution matters, right? It's, it, it, you can't have the, uh, the dinosaurs complaining, oh, if only, if only the oxygen level hadn't dropped and the temperature hadn't dropped and those furry critters wouldn't have won out of one. Uh, you know, th that's sour grapes. So. I say JavaScript actually has benefited from that evolutionary niche it's been in, which is, you know, in terms of space, a huge, huge space, not a niche. But it definitely meant this sort of monopoly that people resent where JavaScript was the only language. You know, it's, you, there before the grace of God goes Python, because otherwise you get this flying amber, broken, you know, distaff version of Python that people would be cursing instead of JavaScript. The other thing about JavaScript I'll say is that I did in spite of the rushing and some blunders, get some things right. So it has this sort of least authority model. If you get rid of a few um, back doors that are pretty wide, it can be a uh, object capability model. And that's what Mark Miller at Google's researched with Google Kaha and now Secure ECMAScript, pretty much folding into the standard. So you can 
with strict mode and a few other things, uh, you can control um, sort of trust in, in a mixed trust environment. You can use object capability security models, um, which are basically safe pointers and, and proxies or membranes to moderate authority. That that's that's a good thing in JavaScript. That's not in every other language, and that also sort of co-evolved with the web. Now there is a concern I have with WebAssembly because it's now in the W3C. There's this sort of cargo cult thinking in the W3C that says you must have the cross-origin um, request a security model. I think that I forget what it stands for. Cores for any anything that goes cross-origin. So by default, you can't load um, WebAssembly. That's bad. There's also this knee-jerk reaction against JavaScript's eval feature. That anything like eval or the function constructor in JavaScript that can take a string of code and turn it into executable objects is is bad. So so WebAssembly should only come from URLs. It should never be come from a string. I think that's just nonsense too. We, we compose programs out of strings all the time. You do it various ways on the web. Even, even if you try to neuter a val, it comes back, uh, it rears its head. Uh, it's very useful. And the security properties are not all or nothing. It's a trade-off. You can still secure programs that use a val. You have to be careful to analyze the code that you're taking in as a string. Um, that's always true because you're taking in code as a string from URLs too. Uh, so there are risks, I think, in the modern world. Security never having been solved and certain problems vexing big companies like Google, you, you get some kind of, um, as I say, cargo culting or uh, all or nothing thinking about security, which is actually, I think, not good for either security or usability. And I don't like the old security usability trade-off. I think the best uh, solutions I've seen have blurred both. Um, on the topic of languages, though, and security, like Rust is a language that has a static uh, safety model, so you cannot have a null point of your reference at runtime. You cannot have your memory errors, out of bounds array indices. Uh, you cannot have uh, race conditions in multi-threaded code, which is kind of a theorem for free that comes with the the, the sort of ownership system. Rust is very interesting being compiled to WebAssembly, and I would choose that over JavaScript if I were doing some heavy machine intensive, but safety-oriented code. Um, so yes, JavaScript is not the hammer for all nails. It never really was. That's why some people would use Java or Flash's ActionScript um, or even compilers uh, that generated code for ActionScript. But those other runtimes kind of died. They became malware vectors, both the Java VM, uh, the JRE plugin, and Flash. Be because they were sort of owned by one company that took its eye off the ball and didn't update the install base fast enough, or if it did, still didn't come after security bugs hard enough, like Flash, uh, it became this, this sort of easy, exploitable uh, bug farm for the bad guys. And they didn't have to worry about the different browser versions. The diversity of browser implementations actually has been a hindrance to those bad guys. And I think that's going to be true of WebAssembly. There'll be different engines to attack. So it's better to have some diversity in your system and implementation level. And that's, that's a deeper point I've made. This is research by Constantine Dovralis of Georgia Tech, I believe, that um, in any network system, you tend to get uh, a, a, in any a network system with layering, like protocol stacks or language stacks or both, you tend to get these sort of hourglass-shaped evolutionary structures where the WASP waste with the hourglass is like JavaScript or HTTP, TCP, IP. It becomes this evolutionary kernel that is in everyone's interest to be backwards compatible and evolve slowly and carefully with security in mind. And then you get great diversity above and below it. Like in, in Devralis's work on network stacks, you get lots of different link layers from the old 10 megabit you know, Ethernet on, on coax all the way to metropolitan Ethernet on fiber um, to satellite or other communications, radio communications to our phones. Those link layers are all different and innovative in their own time and space, but they all funnel this old protocol TCP IP through. And you know that's evolving too. We're getting um, you know HTTP two and and Quick from Google. Um, there's always slow evolution there, but it's very hard to replace those older protocols. We still use the DNS, the domain name system. These form evolutionary kernels. They're stable. They're they conserve their valuable DNA. The same is true of JavaScript. And since the browser won over these other runtimes, uh, even on mobile now, uh, it just seems like this is going to continue for a while. I, I, again, I can't put an, a stop date on JavaScript. <laughs> All right, yeah, last question, and it'll help us transition into our conversation about Brave. So now with WebAssembly, are we about to see a new era of browser wars as everyone competes to have the best WebAssembly implementation? Uh, I, it, it's a good question. I don't know. Um, 
browser wars are hard to predict, but they do come about when there's something really broken in the browser market, like the IE monopoly, you know, convicted in the U.S., and genuinely a case of neglect from Microsoft, which I think felt burned out by the U.S. v. Microsoft antitrust case. After having crushed Netscape, it thought standards are hard. Uh, it hadn't yet been punished in the EU for the Windows Media Player and further browser monopoly behavior, so it, it hadn't formed its standards, bureaucracy, and diplomacy arms that Microsoft has now. Uh, and Microsoft does standards much better now. But at the time, they said, let's go back to Windows. Let's do good old Windows lock-in. We'll use .NET because Anders had done a good job with C Sharp and, and the .NET runtime. Um, and, and that set the stage for a new browser war, which was started by Firefox. When I was one of the people who spun it out, I picked all the technical staff and was one of the you know, general managers, in a sense, of, of the project when we got out of AOL. We knew that the browser market was soft because Microsoft had walked from it. And they left IE6 as a sort of, or at that time, 5, but 6 was no better, a skeleton crude, you know, terrible browser that had huge security problems due to ActiveX. It allowed pop-ups as a form of annoying window-level advertising. So we did things like pop-up blocking. Um, browsers get soft for lots of reasons. I don't think WebAssembly might be the softness, though, because I think all the browser vendors can do a good job in WebAssembly. I'm actually concerned that after the MVP, the minimum viable product level that's good for C and C++ or Rust or languages like that, that the browser vendors might go their separate ways because they can't really agree <laughs> much um, under competitive pressure. It, it will take some disciplined work and some you know, sort of good social networking to keep WebAssembly going toward that further post-MVP roadmap of garbage collected language support, dynamic language, dynamic fast method call support, um, other features that they want. Um, and maybe they'll get there. Um, I hope they do. Maybe they'll get there more slowly. We might have a bit of a pause on WebAssembly after the MVP where it gets absorbed and people figure out on the developer side how to use it best, how to do those modules for machine learning or you know, physics or any other numerically intensive work, how to you know, mix and match the tools because people are all using tool chains now with JavaScript, which was a big breakthrough. Like 16 years ago, people would say, raw JavaScript, I want to write to the metal only, no stinking tools, and then slowly through using Lint and JSLint and ESLint now, and then Babel, 6 to 5 originally, people are now used to compiling, and it's actually been helpful to smooth over browser differences. So having you know people learn as developers how to mix in WebAssembly and compile from another source language to WebAssembly, mix it with their JavaScript, whether it's the whole app or part of it, that will take time. And really, I, I don't want to you know, sound like I'm speculating uh, darkly about you know, the browser vendors failing to cooperate. Maybe they'll do great and keep going on the WebAssembly roadmap. But in truth, it does take time for developers to absorb these things. So we have to give it time. We have to not try to you know, over-predict it or over-constrain it. And so you know, that, that makes me think um, the browser wars, if they are heating up again, are more about higher level concerns such as ads and tracking and, and you know, uh, where browsers are fa failing their users right now because the main browser vendors actually have conflicts of interest with their users. So that you know, moves us on to talking about Brave. Um, the web has moved a lot towards centralization since the web's early, more open days where control over identity and data was distributed. Many people think this centralization combined with other trends have broken the web. Is the web broken, and how does Brave, your software company who's producing a new browser, plan to fix the web? It's a great question. So uh, we all, I think anybody who studied the internet realized it was designed to withstand nuclear strikes, and it was essentially a, a potentially a peer-to-peer -peer network. And peering is important. You have to sort of, you have to route traffic for other people sometimes. This, this became a hot topic with Netflix kind of allegedly poaching bandwidth from Comcast while Comcast was trying to build out and cover the costs of its last mile where the, the video over the top was taking a lot of the bandwidth. You have to share, you have to work on the common infrastructure, but it isn't all peer-to-peer -peer, and it needn't be all peer-to-peer. -peer. We still have you know, trust relationships. Humans have evolved over 10,000 years. We're used to some amount of centralization and it's inevitable. So I'm not one of these radical decentralists who think everything will be decentralized and it will all be different. And you'll have to learn how to be a decentralized user because for one thing, it, it's harder. You don't, you don't trust anybody so you end up having to do more sort of proof examination or you know, confirmation. Um, it's not for everyone. The other thing is since humans are used to some amount of trust relationships in their lives for good or ill, 
uh, they will want to use those. They will want those to be reflected into the web. And like I said about evolutionary kernels, it's inevitable in a network, in, in, you know, from physics to biology to the internet, to have first and second place winners for a time come to you know, take a large share of the market. The problem that I am particularly struck by, though, is the data. And this is something you know, Tim Berners-Lee is also working on with uh, Solid, and other people care about this, uh, certainly in the, in the decentralized web movement, um, the, the DAT folks, Beaker Browser, uh, they care about this. Why should your data be tied into your app? You have this awesome app. All your friends are on it. You want to go there to socialize and chat. But, but don't you own your own data? Shouldn't you, you keep your data separate from the app? Now, no you know, business would get investment if, if it forswore that data. And so... All the, the businesses that keep data on the server side have terms of use that pretty much make, make you the farm animal for them holding your data and, and harvesting uh, value from it, mostly for advertising. Uh, but you know, maybe some other services that are, they can charge for. Um, that also seems kind of inevitable, but Brave is trying a different approach. We don't want to have your data on the server. We don't want to see your data in the clear. We don't even want to have the temptation of it. We want your data to be owned by you on your device encrypted when it's synchronized cross-device for your use as, you know, shared bookmarks and tabs and, and history and things like that. Uh, and we propose to offer you, you, you would choose this, it would be opt-in, the ability to add some local uh, machine learning to add value, mine that data for things like the opportunity to get ads that are anonymous, that pay you a revenue share. So there's no cookies, no tracking. The ad matching happens only on your device. And how that would work is pretty simple to describe. Ads don't come out every minute and they don't change all the time. They take some creative effort to produce and they sometimes run campaigns for weeks. You've probably seen them follow you around longer than you'd like. That means we can have a catalog that's a download that can be Delta updated of just the ad edge cache URLs. These don't telegraph a lot of information except to whole network actors like the NSA. They can come with keywords to match against. And again, if the user of Brave doesn't opt into this, none of this happens. But if they opt into it, there'd be a local agent in the AI sense, machine learning, studying everything about you that would be transparent. It would use uh, you know, naive Bayes or other simple machine learning that can explain itself. One of the problems with machine learning that uses convolutional neural nets, deep learning, it can't really explain why it made decisions. And there is, I think, coming in Europe, in the GDPR, this right to explanation where you're supposed to ask your, your machine learning. Why did you decide that? And if it can't tell you, there's going to be trouble. Well, in, in the Brave philosophy, we keep your data local. It's encrypted if it goes anywhere near servers that we control. And it, um, it's encrypted with your key, not ours. And um, it, it's studied by algorithms that can, can be explained. And those algorithms, yet, in spite of that relative simplicity and transparency, I think can do a, a really great job, a much better job than a lot of the sort of parasitic ad tech players do today. We've all seen not only ads that retarget you annoyingly, but really bad ads that just mistarget you. And you have no idea why. You can say, oh, I'd like to opt out of this ad. Good luck. A friend Rob Leathern tried this, and he went to 300 different company screens to opt out, and some of them were just broken forms. They, they 404 it. So it's kind of a joke to say that you're in control of your data right now if you don't defend it. So Brave's posture is to defend by default. We block third-party ads and trackers. We use various techniques for this. Some of them are shared with other ad blockers and tracking protection software. It's a shared resource like the disconnect.me tracking protection list or the easy list, so-called, that a lot of blockers use that Adblock Plus uh, pioneered. But we do not do anything like the whitelisting or you know, what might be suspected of being pay-to-play uh, where you take money from advertisers and then lo and behold, sometimes those ads get through your ad blocker. Um, I, I've had conversations with people who do this at Adblock Plus. They say, no, no, you know, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. We only allow acceptable ads. And by the way, we sustain ourselves with a little Robin Hood, you know, robbing from the rich. I'm not convinced. No one's convinced. It, it looks like they're double ending the system in a way that creates inherent conflicts and temptations. And Brave doesn't want to do that. So anything we do in the space of sort of decentralized ads is going to be user controlled. It's going to be on device in the clear data only. No, no in the clear data on servers. It's going to block cookies and trackers. And, and this is important for security because you may be aware malware has come into ad exchanges, third party ad exchanges. And by the malware vendor, buying cheap ad slots, they've been able to get malvertisements, so-called, onto even the New York Times last March. Um, 
and uh, BBC Online, AOL, other sites. And it's an ongoing problem. It's not a well-understood problem because these look like ads. You cannot judge them by their pixels and say that's malware. They even hide the malware loader script using steganography, small perturbations to the, the color and the luminance of the images in the ad. And they extract those perturbations with a little innocuous looking JavaScript that creates a string and then evals it. <laughs> Let's go back to my eval point earlier. And, and that, that evals to a loader that loads an exploit kit. And the exploit kit is just like a recipe for trying this, trying that, trying the other. See if the Flash player is there, see if it's got this known vulnerability or this sort of dark net not yet disclosed or patched vulnerability. And it tries Silverlight maybe, it tries browser vulnerabilities, and it can often Pwn your system because you you shouldn't have Flash. Brave turns Flash off by default. Um, these these old plugins that aren't well maintained that come from a single vendor, like I said, become uh, sort of honeypot uh, bug farms over time. Just very attractive because they're they're so widely distributed from a single vendor, uh, and they're not well maintained. Uh, even if they're well maintained, every code every significant piece of software has security vulns, like I mentioned, so they have to be patched up. That's that's the other thing that exploit kits look for is, is older versions of plugins. And when they find them, they can put ransomware on your system or they could subtly corrupt it to make it part of a botnet. So there's a real danger to advertising that I think also motivates defending your data. But for a decentralized web in the future, to say that we're going to go from where we are today toward you owning your data by sort of gentle or even harsh language at Facebook or Twitter to say, give me my data, I own my data, you can have your app and you, know, you can absorb my social graph next edge connect connectivity to my friends, but I should own you know, the, my direct friend list, I should own my, my tweets or my posts. Good luck with that. I know people who use RSS to syndicate their posts to Facebook and they also send them to Twitter. They have to run their own servers, they have to be you know, very technically savvy. Most users will never do that. Um, if Facebook doesn't like the way you're interacting with it, like through a, a tool or a proxy, they will shut you down. They've done that before. So they want you to stay on the farm <laughs> as a farm animal uh, for, the, for you know, harvesting attention. And, and the economics uh, behind attention are interesting because they, they go to advertising but also to search. They create a lot of value for users in, if they're well done, like not just ads that some people like. Some people do like ads, let's face it. Some people hate them and never want to see them. But search results, in some sense, require noticing attention. Uh, Google made it clear that, and demonstrated very well, that sometimes they can correct your query but based on other people's queries faster than you can, or they can predict your query. And that can be helpful. There's a privacy trade-off there that we don't like at Brave. But even with your own search history, your own query log, you can do a lot. And that's where I find... Uh, you know, this enormous interest uh, in the future for Brave in looking at it, personal query log on device and studying it. Because when I'm searching for something, I've often, I'm refining a search I did last week that I've sort of forgotten about, or I'm doing a, a search that I've done before. So uh, the, the, the idea of, of decentralizing the web, I think, has to start aggressively from the other end, which is the user's client devices, the end that's currently just treated as a dumb terminal in the worst case. Make it smart, make it hold the data, and then we'll have a, a more level playing field on which to decentralize appropriately, you know, use, use peer-to-peer protocols, use blockchains, um, use, use the techniques that are evolving still to decentralize the data of the web. Yeah, it's fascinating. But how does Brave plan to monetize this platform? So if, and we talked about this right when we launched uh, a year ago, January, if we get users who choose to take these private zero-knowledge ads, I didn't mention the other part of this, we privately match against that ad catalog without any cookies. So the, the machine learning that you would opt into would study your, your sort of what you're surfing for in this group of tabs and possibly keep it separate from other windows where you do other tasks like, like um, research or work and develop a model for predicting a few keywords to match against the, the catalog that's been downloaded and, and Delta updated. That's a very private way of getting the right ad at the right time in front of you. And with the right publisher partners, we'd even replace the ad on the publisher's page. We wouldn't want to do it without the publisher's permission. There are other ways to get this to you, though. Then the problem is confirming that the ad was viewed or acted upon. Some ads only pay or pay better if you actually click on the, you know, download this app or game at the end link in the ad, like it's a video ad. We could do those too with high privacy, deterministic anonymity, anonymous identity through the same zero knowledge proof protocol we're using for what's already in Brave as a beta program, 
grave payments, so-called, a way of automatically donating to your top sites to give back you know, $5 a month, $10 a month in lieu of the, the ads that you blocked. And people are using that. We have over 48,000 uh, user wallets created right now. Um, that's, that's something we're going to turn on even more as we get a, a better system for getting funds into that user wallet. And that's just part of our ambition. Once we have that donation system at scale, we can then start paying users who choose to see zero-knowledge ads for their attention. Because when you choose to take ads, even if they're well-targeted at you and you like them and they, they help you find things that you want to buy – they're still taking up some space on your screen or some space somewhere. It could be email if, the, if you want to get it through email promotions once a day. It could be a chat bot. It could be a full screen video channel that's outside the page. However they go, they, they take some of your attention. So you should get a share of that advertiser spend that comes in from the, the brands and their, you know, their servants, the agencies. That money currently goes through a very inefficient and fraud prone system where people slice away at the pie until the publisher is left with you know, a tiny slice of pie. We want to give a bigger slice to publishers. We want users to get a slice. And we talked about this last year. And of course, the first thing that happened was the publishers who were often like zombified as if they were, you know, a roach that had been bitten by a jewel wasp. <laughs> jewel wasps will zombify roaches and ride around them. I don't think you've ever seen this. There are videos on YouTube. Uh, the publishers start howling as if they were the ad tech partners that were actually threatening. Because what we're proposing with Brave would get rid of a lot of the parasites and the middle players who are taking out too much of the pie. Um, but the user would get a share of the revenue. And the revenue is there. $70 billion plus was spent on digital advertising last year in the U.S. And I, I dare say most of it was wasted. Right? There's an old maxim in advertising called Wanamaker's Dilemma attributed to Jude Watermaker, who owned a chain of department stores in Philly over 100 years ago. It's, he's alleged to have said, half my advertising budget is wasted. I just don't know which half. And this was in the days of newspaper ads and catalog ads, and you could you didn't have you know computers with JavaScript to tell you when someone viewed an ad, so you were sort of guessing what would sell and guessing where to buy the ad space in the newspaper. If half was wasted then, you would think with computers it would be more efficient now, but it's actually worse. There's fraud. There's retargeting where people f make ads follow you around that don't work for you, and they drive you get an ad blocker, and then you're lost to the system, so-called a negative externality, sort of like pollution. Uh, attention pollution. There's also um, this sort of problem that they have to guess what websites you'll go to. If you're uh, uh, advertising uh, Ford trucks and you, you try to identify likely buyers of Ford trucks, you still don't know exactly where you're going to hit them on the web. So you buy ad slots on 10,000 sites. That's inevitably wasting more of your money. If you just could get the likely Ford truck buyer at the right moment, in their browser, which is what we propose to do with Brave, you could spend far less and then there'd be more money to go to the publisher and there'd be some for the user. And that's, that's our model. It's, it, it basically takes, if you think about advertising online now, there's the, the buy side, the brands and the agencies that help them that put money into the system to buy ad spaces. There's the supplier sell side, that's the publishers who give up ad space on their page. In the middle is this incredible... Uh, sort of ecosystem of, of middle players, ad servers, data management platforms, optimization services, measurement services, anti-fraud services, and they all take a cut. Take that parasitic middle ecosystem out, put, put the user in the middle, give them tools like Brave with blockchains and zero-knowledge proofs, give them privacy, let them control their data. That's a much simpler and more efficient system. It, it guarantees that there's a real user, not a robot, viewing the ad. It guarantees that they saw the ad. So that's, that's what we're trying to build, and that's definitely a viable business because we know right now <laughs> for advertising, there's a somewhat viable business for somebody there. It turns out increasingly it's Google and Facebook. If you look at how the $70 billion is spent, uh, like 80% of it going to Google and Facebook is not really great. Of the increment over 2015, where more like $60 billion was spent, almost all of that added $10 billion is going to Google and Facebook. So it's becoming a duopoly of Google and Facebook that's absorbing all the spending because they own not only a lot of the middle tracking powers as parts of their businesses, they also own, in the case of Facebook, this really is their business, they own the publisher side or the app side. They, they have the user-facing you know, property on which to advertise, which in Facebook's case is your feed or your Instagram. Um, and Google has the search engine result page, but they also bought DoubleClick in 2008. So they, they sell um, ad-serving and they sell this sort of uh, ad exchange business to publishers um, and advertisers use it so they take a cut when the ads go through. That, that means um, there's, there's sort of a conflict of interest on their part. And I mentioned this earlier. Whenever you have 
big companies start to find their business interests in conflict with their user interests, especially browser user interests, like we did when we were doing Firefox against Internet Explorer 6, you find an opportunity for a new browser war. Is it morally okay to block online advertisements and replace them with your own brave advertisements, given that for some websites it is the only way they make money? So let's take that in two parts. First of all, is it morally okay to block ads? It absolutely is, and here's why. Uh, Doc Searles talks about this. Um, there was a, a, a great Medium post he wrote where he talked about his sister, who's a 20-year-plus Navy veteran, who would take the New York Times Sunday paper edition and she would field strip it. She would take out everything she wouldn't read, ads, news, definitely some ads she would not read. Other things she wanted to read, like the travel section, and she would see the ads there. Maybe she would take a classified insert that was all ads because she knew she wanted to look through those. Ad blocking existed long before digital ads and, and browsers and ad blocking extensions. Right? People were always free to field strip their newspapers, to ignore things like that. Um, so ad blocking is actually woven into the web standards. The web standards are not a DRM'd video stream or image where you cannot tamper with the ad because of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. As Cory Doctorow explains, DRM is really legal, a legal hack to try to uh, control supply of playback devices to jack up prices a little bit. That's all it is. And all the technology for it turns out to be kind of evadable. People, people pirate movies all the time, right? It, even if you have very strong so-called um, you know, high-definition DRM or ultra-high-definition DRM that uses secret computers inside your computer running in a hypervisor in hardware ring minus two, um, people put an HDMI dongle on and they get the, the high-definition pixels out that way and they put them on, on the dark net. So DRM doesn't work technically, but it has legal teeth thanks to acts like the DMCA in the U.S. and its counterparts around the world. And that's sort of the nasty truth about, about DRM. Um, but the web is not like that. The web is a set of uh, hyperlink text, hypertext, and multimedia embedded in that. And it, it was always designed intentionally so you can mix and match pieces of it. You can pull out just the text and use it in reader mode. If someone is visually impaired or handicapped, they can use a screen reader to turn text to speech. They can throw away the ads. And that was always part of the web design. And to walk that back or try to DRM the web is, in my view, you know, heinous. It's, it's like depraved. It's completely wrong. And I think most consumers agree. Nobody really wants that. People want their Netflix. They do not want the web to suddenly say you can't block ads. So, so consumer sentiment was entirely on Brave's side last year when we sort of poked a stick at the ad tech um, sort of parasites and ended up with the <laughs> the poor roaches they're riding on the backs of. Some of the publishers wrote us a letter. It was legally meaningless, but it was threatening because it said, how dare you replace our ads? So let's answer the second part of your question. Blocking is, is legal, legal and moral and ethical and, in my view, necessary for safety due to malvertisements. Now, can you replace ads? Well, that's a gray zone legally, but also we wanted to pay the publishers. We always said we would give the publishers 70% in full of that revenue share. And that's more than they make from their third-party ad partners now. The IAB, the Interactive Advertising Bureau, in 2014 did a study and said, oh, publishers make 45%. Isn't that great? No. In the App Store, the Apple App Store set the standard, 70%. In old media like television and print, 85%. Going down to 45% is not good. And actually, publishers with doing third-party or programmatic ads will tell you, 45%, I wish, I make you know, 30%, I'm making 20% because they don't necessarily know the full gross spend that's coming their way. And all these middle players, these parasites, take so many cuts out of it that what's left to them is, is not 45%, it's less. So with Brave, we propose to do replacement giving them 70% in full, 55% directly, right, right direct to them as fast as possible. And, and yet that wasn't good enough. They, they kind of had a knee-jerk reaction because I think they've been captured by the current ecosystem and it's... It's, it's parasitic middle players. But the other thing we did was we didn't build this. We just talked about it. And if we built it, we would do it with publishers as partners. So we would want the publishers to prefer us. Because think about it. Brave users coming to the uh, publisher are going to block the ads by default, these third-party ads. So the publishers lost that portion of their revenue. And publishers do sometimes do what's called direct sales. They take their best ad slots and they sell directly that space to a brand like um, – L.com sells to Louis Vuitton to put a beautiful handbag custom video ad in. 
That we'd like not to block because that ad is, is almost like a sponsorship ad. It's almost like an image on the publisher's page. Why would we mess with it? Unfortunately, it's placed through Google's double-click ad server and it's full of tracking for various reasons. But that could be, that could be improved through zero-knowledge proofs. That's okay. But that's the direct sold ads. The indirect or the programmatic ads are the ones that we proposed to replace. We're going to block them anyway. So saying to a publisher, hey, you've, you're starting from zero with Brave users. Why not try our alternative to your unsafe you know, uh, third-party ad partners who are taking too much of the revenue and sometimes letting malware through? Why not use Brave as your third-party ad partner? And we would do it with publishers as partners. That that we didn't exactly say because we were trying to make a point. And that's why it was so funny. I heard this story from other people. When you do poke the ecosystem this way, usually you get this, this zombified roach, the publisher screaming loudest at you, but really the person who's threatened, the actor who's threatened is the ad tech middle player. And, and they always lead with copyright. The letter that we got said, how dare you infringe our copyright? And I thought, copyright, interesting. So you hold copyright on the third-party ads that are placed in slots in the New York Times by JavaScript you don't write. And that JavaScript occasionally can insert ransomware, the Angular exploit kit, as happened on the New York Times in March 2016. So you hold copyright on ransomware. Well, that's very interesting. I didn't know the New York Times wanted that copyright and liability. And of course, they say, no, 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 that's not us. That was a mistake. You know, we're not liable. Um, no one was harmed. We never heard about that. But it happened. And it shows, you know, the fallacy of treating digital ads like they are ink on paper. Now, if 100 years ago, the era of Jude Wanamaker, I went up to your grandmother's door and I took the Sunday Times and I secretly, you know, sort of did paste up of my own ads on top of the ink on paper ads that were on that newspaper page and then tried to, you know, get some revenue from doing that furtive ad replacement, that would be immoral and that would be illegal, I'm sure. Uh, it would be at least something called tortious interference in the business of the New York Times. Uh, and it, I would be trespassing on grandma's doorstep. That's not how digital ads work. They are not ink on paper. They are not, they are not DRM'd pixels in video. They are loaded separately from different servers. The thing that loads them is a script written not by the New York Times, but not even by its direct or, uh, contracted ad partner. Sometimes the script is written by somebody in Russia, seven degrees of separation away from the New York Times. So do not confuse the essential differences here. There, there is a system people are used to thinking about, which is very visible and even tactile, which is ink on paper ads. There is the digital world of scripted third-party ads, completely different, completely unsafe, subject to parasites, malware vendors, basically rentiers who take too much money out um, in, in these middle fees that they extract while they let anything through. And because they extract fees on, on anything that goes through and on any clicks that happen on ads, they have perverse incentives. They will let malware through because, hey, they get a fee, whether it's a good ad or malware. If there's a click that was done by a robot to steal ad revenue, because you have that kind of fraud too, you have actual fake users and fake publisher sites being set up as in methbot to steal revenue, the middle player still makes the fee. What's, you know, what did they know? Hey, pay me. <laughs> it, it's all good. Um, so there's a conflict of interest again. And that's, that's something that we definitely are targeting at Brave because nobody you know, works for free. There's no free lunch. Somebody has to lose if there's going to be a better internet adver advertising system. And I think that's the, the 2,000 or so companies that parasitically infest the middle of the ad tech system. And, and I would say also Google and Facebook have to shape up. They, they don't get off free, and they are heavy trackers, especially Google, um, and uh, we're out to shake that up. Good customer relationships define the success of your business. Zendesk helps you build better mobile apps and retain users. With Zendesk mobile SDKs, you can bring native in-app support to your app quickly and easily. If a user discovers a bug in your app, that user can view help content and start a conversation with your support team without leaving your app. The conversations go into Zendesk and can automatically include information about the user's app information, device information, usage history, and more. Best of all, this is included with Zendesk for no extra charge. Use the out-of-the-box iOS UI to get up and running quickly, or build your own UI and work with the SDK API providers. Keep your customers happy with Zendesk. Software Engineering Daily listeners can use promo code 
SE Daily for $177 off. Thanks to Zendesk for supporting Software Engineering Daily. And you can check out zendesk.com slash SE Daily to support Software Engineering Daily and get $177 off your Zendesk. So Brave is built on Chromium, a browser engine developed mostly by Google. Are there any concerns around using Google's browser technology to create a competing browser? Google is you know, dominant with Chrome. It's not going to reach the Internet Explorer level of 95% market share that you read about in Wikipedia. Some say 94, some say 96. The way that browser uh, market share was measured has changed, and nobody's sure, but it was high. 95% is pretty much monopoly. By the time Standard Oil was, was subject to antitrust action back in the Gilded Age, it was actually in the 20th century, um, they were down to 70%. They'd already declined. So unfortunately, I think... You know, Google getting to 80% or 85% with Chrome wouldn't get them antitrust attention in the U.S. Um, in Europe, it already has, and things about Android and Search have gotten them in antitrust uh, uh, re regulator sites in Europe. Um, Chromium, but my point in all this is that Chromium, which is built around Blink, which is a fork of WebKit, you'll still find WebKit references all over the source code, uh, Apple's engine that was forked from KHTML, um, Chromium Blink is dominant. If you want to compete as a browser, you pretty much have to use that code. I say this as a founder of Mozilla. We had our own engine. Mozilla has it still called Gecko. They're slowly adding the compatibility that's needed for not just standards that evolve, but de facto standards that were set on the mobile web by the iPhone, by WebKit in iOS in 2007 on. And those standards, some of them were quite brilliant innovations for mobile you know, touch response and rounded corners. Some of them were in the web standards. Some of them were still coming along. And what's worst, I think, most vexing, but part of the nature of the web, there's old web content out there that just assumes it was the iPhone and uses what, you know, sort of a WebKit prefix on the CSS property, the selector or whatever. Um, those de facto standards need to be engineered into any new engine that has to compete. Now, there will be new engines up and coming. There's the Servo engine, which I was executive sponsor of in Mozilla Research at Mozilla. It's coming along, and it's got some amazing innovative uh, components, like uh, it has a web render component that uses seven shader programs on the GPU to render all of CSS. It decomposes CSS rendering into those seven shader programs and composes them in parallel for maximum speed up. There's also a font renderer that can render, you know, sort of rasterized font glyphs, uh, font vectors, and, and, and do it on the GPU again in parallel and safely using uh, Rust um, and shader programs. There's just some amazing work there, but Servo is not web compatible enough. Otherwise, I'd be using it in Brave. So I'm using Chromium. And on iOS, the rules Apple imposes on developers require you to use their versions of web engines, which are either the old one, UI WebView, or the new one, WK WebView, um, the Safari WebView. And that, that's the WebKit engine that Apple's still tending that, from which Chromium Blink forked Blink. So really, uh, you don't have much choice right now due to this market structure. The winners of the last two iterations of the browser wars, uh, Chrome kind of won uh, on desktop through Google's wealth and market power and distribution power and Microsoft sort of subsiding uh, from the force that used to be on the PC and the PC era. And Apple, of course, is very strong at the high end of the smartphone market. Um, Google, Android on the smartphone market helped too. Uh, Chrome, Chrome is number one, 80 something percent, maybe 70 something percent. Opinions vary. Um, the iPhone is, is strong and it's influential and you know I carry one, a lot of people do, in valuable markets. So it, Apple can kind of control the ball a little bit in web standards when they choose to and not let it be a Google-run show. This really drives Google crazy, I know. Uh, some of them used to be at Microsoft. Some of them know from that era Microsoft felt it could do anything it wanted. And in IE4, when Microsoft got the upper hand over Netscape, where I was still working and you know, like watching a train wreck in slow motion, um, couldn't do a thing about it because Netscape had gone off on an acquisition bender with the mad money it made from its IPO. And acquiring a bunch of companies never works. Just ask Yahoo. Um, Microsoft did a creditable job, at least on Windows, with IE4. It was you know, not very secure with ActiveX all over the place, but they, they really did kind of embrace the JavaScript idea that I had in Netscape 2. They elaborated my work to create the document object model into something they called DHTML. And they did kind of own the web standards. They made friends with the W3C uh, in that era, in 96, you know, 97. Um, 
Google is trying to I can control the ball as if they had 95% market share, but they don't. And they do control a lot of the ball, and maybe they should. But again, there's a sort of conflict, macroeconomic conflict of interest against their users because they're an advertising-funded business. They will not put ad blocking into Chrome by default, not easily or lightly. Um, maybe I can get them to you know, sort of help standardize stuff from Brave. That would be good. Um, so th there, there's there's a you know there's a new market structure and a, and a new um, duopoly just like we saw I spoke of earlier with ad tech with Facebook and Google there's the sort of Apple Google duopoly Microsoft's browsers Edge and IE as a pair are slowly losing market share last I looked it's still happening even though they've worked hard on Edge and they're very proud of it and they cleaned up a lot of the code and got rid of all the ActiveX and other junk uh, it's just kind of too bad that there isn't a new browser engine coming in. I would like to see Servo get there. It needs a product and it needs a sort of a tip of the spear market in which to get that product to users. Maybe it's VR, AR, maybe it's something, you know, outside of the just a browser model where you face the huge, you know, billion plus web page website um, array of, of content you have to be compatible with, including its WebKit or you know, Chrome only versions on mobile. And then you know, if, if, if Servo can't be compatible with that, it's just not going to get into those, those mature product categories. But it might get into a new product. And it might make it through other means. Um, maybe we'll, we'll get more machine learning to co engineer compatibility in our code, write our co compatibility code for us. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm a technological optimist. So there will be a new web engine someday, and it will replace the sort of WebKit lineage or sort of supersede it somehow, um, like I said, perhaps through some machine learning. That would be cool, and I look forward to it. I just can't bet the farm on it with, with, with Brave. And it almost doesn't matter. The, the web is, is – Google's doing all right with some of its innovations. We had to teach them not to waste time on Dart and Portable Native Client when I was at Mozilla. Got them to see the light with WebAssembly after AsmJS. Uh, JavaScript is evolving. Google's participating. Um, you know, the service worker work at Google is, is good and helps you have an offline model and, and a sort of way of – intercepting network requests locally so you can do things uh, that were impossible before, um, do offline, do um, smart apps that act more like native apps on mobile. That's all good. Uh, the real innovation, I think, has to come in serving users in more of this decentralized web mission we spoke of earlier, where the user isn't just an attention farm animal whose attention is being harvested <laughs> and degraded. By the way, people talk about attention as a commodity, but it's, it's actually a scarce resource. It's information that's that's too plentiful, and it degrades. You know, you need to resynthesize dopamine, or you get tired, you get blindness to banner ads. So, I think um, the innovation in the engine space will happen, but it needs a, a hot new product like we had with Firefox when we got Gecko to market. And by the way, taking uh, Gecko into Firefox in 2003 and four, uh, Firebird, <laughs> Phoenix. Uh, Firefox in 2004 took off, and it had web compatibility, even though it had the Gecko engine, because Netscape had been so powerful. A lot of the uh, web was still feature testing for, is it Netscape or IE? They would say, if document.all, and then they would assume it's IE, else they would write for Netscape. So other new engines like WebKit in, or HTML in, in Safari in 2002 started drafting off the else clause that it was Netscape-based web content. And that lineage, that, that sort of patrimony of, of Netscape content helped Gecko succeed in Firefox. Firefox got to 27% market share in 2011, I believe, peak, and then it fell to Chrome. Um, it's maybe stable, but still kind of low compared to that. You have to get something new out there that users get, and users don't really understand a little tweak in HTML or a little difference in JavaScript. Even WebAssembly, like you asked earlier, might be a point of difference if some browser is really slow or just doesn't do it. But if they're all good at it and it's been designed to be, you know, have a deterministic performance model, then WebAssembly won't be the differentiator. It'll be something higher order. With Brave, we find blocking not just ads but the invisible tracking scripts on mobile saves you half your data plan. It, it speeds up on the benchmarks we've shown. I've tweeted them recently three to seven times against Chrome on Android and, and three to eight times against iOS Safari. So there's a higher level of user value there that you can sell without having to get down into the WebAssembly details. Okay, so Brave blocks the accumulation of data. And for some companies, this is blocking their accumulation of power. As in the information age, data translates to power through data science processes, such as the training of advanced artificial intelligence algorithms. Does it hurt societal progress to keep data away 
from these companies who want to train algorithms from that data? Yeah, I, I don't agonize about this one because, first of all, we leak data all the time. It's very hard to enforce um, perfect confidentiality. Um, even when you encrypt something, there are side channels, timing channels. Um, fingerprinting you know, is it, endlessly uh, innovating to use different measures, uh, different bits of entropy that you leak. And so with Brave, the fingerprinting defense we do, which uh, Yanzu has been working on, is still opt-in by site. Uh, it... it it protects against canvas fingerprinting, web, web audio fingerprinting, web GL fingerprinting, um, battery status fingerprinting. And Jan's worked on H, some sort of clever uh, sort of HSTS fingerprinting, so-called. Um, it's really a clever thing called Sniffly you can look up. There are lots of ways to fingerprint. What matters is the ones that are used at, in practice at a large scale because the so-called data science companies or the ad tech companies that claim they they make societally beneficial use of data, don't have the wits to do their own custom fingerprinting. They use a script. There's a fingerprint2.js script that's commonly used. That's what you want to block. But in spite of all that, as I say, people leak data all the time. People give up data voluntarily. I mentioned earlier, decentralization isn't for everything. We have trusted relationships in our lives. We will give up data, and we probably should give up data in some cases, uh, to a legitimate authority or for a legitimate value exchange. The problem with giving up data on just browsing the web to trackers who promise to get better ads to publishers is, A, they haven't done that. The ads have gotten worse. B, they promise better yield that is revenue per ad slot to publishers. That's gotten worse. Publishers are going out of business. So if the middle players are actually parasites whispering in your ear, it's good when I, when I eat some of the food you ate, but they're actually making the host wither and die that's not societally beneficial. That's not good data. Uh, and that's not voluntary, really. Um, this is the other point I think Doc Searles made in his Medium post that I mentioned earlier, that when you go to a department store and you see a flyer for uh, some, something for sale, the flyer doesn't go fly to your car, stick to your windshield, follow you home, stick to your pants as you walk in your house, attach itself to your wall, and install a spy cam. But that's what the trackers do in the current ad tech system. That is not voluntary. And in fact, there's an open question. Some privacy advocates are arguing the European emerging privacy regulations, e-privacy and the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, uh, require that users must consent to any kind of tracking. It cannot be done invisibly without consent. It cannot be done under duress, where they say, the publisher says, you must turn off your ad blocker or tracking protection extension in order to view my content that otherwise is freely available and that, in fact, is not behind the paywall. That would be duress. That would violate consent. So talk about moral philosophy earlier. I mean, here, here's where it hits reality. You're being tracked against your will. It's not helping the publishers. It's not even helping the advertisers. There's a lot of fraud, a lot of waste. Um, who's it helping? It's helping a bunch of rentiers and, and parasites. Well, let's, let's fix that problem, and then let's talk about the societal value of giving out data. Because I, I said it's inevitable that in any network you'll get the first and second place you know, Pareto optimal winners, the 80-20 or the 75-15, you know, and then the 10% is a bunch of little guys struggling to be the next big thing. And it's stable for a while. The problem is monopolies tend to, you know, buy politicians and make themselves 100-year institutions by corrupting politics. That, that's a problem I don't propose to solve. But, um, and I don't quite see that happening with ads. So, I, you know, we've been called un-American at Brave. And when I was at Mozilla and we talked about tracking protection, the Interactive Advertising Bureau started saying it was un-American. Sorry, I don't buy it. Let me, as an American, defend my data. You can have it if I think I'm getting value for it. I have to see who I'm dealing with. I have to know that I can trust them. They can't give it out to their cousin in Russia. All right. Uh, thank you so much. This was a great interview. Thanks for coming on to Software Engineering Daily. You're welcome. A lot of fun. Thanks. Thanks to Symphono for sponsoring Software Engineering Daily. Symphono is a custom engineering shop where senior engineers tackle big tech challenges while learning from each other. Check it out at symphono.com slash sedaily. That's S-Y-M-P-H-O-N-O dot com slash sedaily. Thanks again, Symphono. Wow.